to understand why Anatoly Bondarchuk is a legend of sports science, you could look at the results of the 1983 World Championships, where the athletes he coached in the hammer throw took home gold, silver and three of the top four spots. You could also look at the results from the 1988 Olympic hammer throw, where his athletes took home gold, silver and bronze. Furthermore, you could look at the results of the 1986 European Championships, where his athletes took home a clean sweep. In total, Bundachuk's athletes took home a clean sweep of gold, silver and bronze at four of the five Olympics which they were allowed to enter from 1976 until 1992. If you factor in major championships including the World Championships, European Championships and Olympics, they won 28 out of 36 medals during this time frame, including every gold medal. Bondarchuk is also an outstanding athlete in his own right, being a former world record holder and also winning Olympic gold in the hammer throw at the 1972 Olympics. His chief protégé, Yuri Sadiq, holds the world record in the hammer throw, one of the longest lasting records in track and field and a record that still stands to this day. His other student, Sergei Litvinov, holds the Olympic record. Critics of the Bondarchuk system may point to the use of steroids by the Soviet Union. It may be true to say that the Soviets did introduce steroids to the Olympics and the world of international sport. However, there is reason to believe that the use of steroids may be far from the whole story explaining the reason for Bondarchuk's athlete success. Firstly, whilst Bondarchuk's athletes in the Soviet Union did use steroids, if you look at the kinds of physiques that the athletes had on screen, you can see that there is nothing crazy about the kind of physiques that they had. Whilst it would be true to acknowledge that some of the more androgenic steroids can influence athletic performance more than physique, I think the relatively normal physique of the Soviet throwers suggests that they were not taking steroids in any kind of crazy doses. If you contrast the physique of the Soviet athletes with the physique of Harold Connolly, the 1956 Olympic champion in the hammer throw representing the United States. Personally, I think, if anything, the American athlete looks like he's on just as many steroids, if not more, and he is an admitted steroid user. The use of steroids by American and other Western athletes will continue through the 70s and 80s. You can hear American shot putter Greg DeFralis talk about his use of steroids in preparation for the 1988 Olympics coming up now. It's awesome. It's a ballistic feeling. It's, you're the most unbelievable athlete in the world. You believe it. You feel it. It's incredible, man. Yeah, it's wrong morally. It's wrong all the way. It's wrong. Of course it's wrong. It's all wrong. But I didn't have a choice. Looking at more specific data, in a survey by American discus thrower Jay Sylvester, at the 1972 Olympics, 61% of athletes admitted to using steroids in the run-up to the Olympics and 68% of athletes admitted to using steroids at some point in their life. This survey did include athletes from middle distance running, sprinting and jump related events, who I think are less likely to use steroids than throwers. I don't want to keep going on about the steroid issue. Athletes from other countries may have been filtered out from the elite level by their refusal to use steroids. However, equally, I think it would be a mistake to dismiss the success of the Bondatrix system as a consequence solely of steroid use. So what of the actual training methods of Bondachuk? I think it would be fair to say that in comparison to a lot of other modern coaches and coaches who came before him, Bondachuk put a high emphasis on the selection of exercise that are used in training. Quote Bondachuk directly, he says, my periodization does not depend anymore on the dynamics of the volume and the intensity of the training load during the preparatory and the competitive periods but it depends on the system of exercises. Bondarchuk classified exercises into four categories depending on how relevant they were to the sport the athlete would be competing in. The first category was general exercises that used different energy systems and movements to the competitive movements. For a throwing athlete, jogging would be a general exercise. The next category would be special preparatory exercises. Exercises that use the same muscles and systems, but different movements. For a hammer thrower, a power clean would be a special preparatory exercise. As like a throw, you are doing an explosive exercise, but you are dealing with different joint angles, 
to lift the weight up. The next category would be special developmental exercises. Exercises that use the same muscles, same systems and parts of the competitive movement. For a hammer thrower, rotational medicine ball throws would be a special developmental exercise as they use the parts of the body responsible for rotation. The final category of exercises are competition exercises. Competition exercises included the use of not just the competition weight the athlete would be using, but a variation of heavier and lighter implements, as you can see here being used by Bondo Chuk protege Yuri Sadiq, if you pay attention to the size of the implement he is throwing. Beyond his emphasis on exercise selection, Bondo Chuk puts a lot of emphasis on technique and has been critical of other coaches paying what he perceives as a lack of attention to this aspect of throwing performance. The most unorthodox part of the Bondo Chuk system, I think, is his use of specialised developmental exercises and his use of mixing technique with strength in his use of competition exercises. I think there can be some debate as to what exactly would be classified as a specialised preparatory exercise versus specialised developmental exercise versus a competition exercise. Having used some examples from the hammer throw, next to switch attention to other sports. If you look at the technique of a shot putter on screen, and then look at some specialised strength exercises that were being done in the Soviet Union at Bondarchuk's time, as you can see, they combine elements of the shot put technique with strength. I do not know if Bondarchuk would have advocated the use of these exercises specifically, but he has been critical of American coaches' lack of attention to special strength. To quote a Bondachuk interview, which I will leave a link in the description for you to read for yourself, he says, quote, Until the US realises the research of special and dynamic strength, there will be minimal hammer throwers over 80 metres, unquote. Unfortunately for a lot of modern Western coaches, much of the research on special strength sits non-translated in Russian strength and conditioning journals though there is still certainly some modern research which supports the use of special strength. To quote again from the same interview, Bondarchuk goes on to say, quote, The US needs to change their mind and listen. It's about special strength and technique. They should think less about maximum strength and more about explosive strength and technique. Unquote. To quote from another Bondarchuk interview, to which I will also leave a link in the description, he says when asked, quote, how much work do you think is being done in the area of technique analysis and the development of special strength? Quote, and then Bondarchuk responds with, quote, Although it is of the utmost importance, nearly nothing is being done in the United States. Unquote. So as you have heard from the quotes, Bondarchuk was a big believer in the importance of special strength and technique. There are other channels which get into debates about the optimal throwing technique. I'm not going to get into that too much here, as this is mainly a martial arts channel. I'm going to focus more on the issue of special strength, looking at examples of the use of specialised developmental and competition exercises in other sports, and then looking at how specialised strength exercises are being applied to combat sports. If you look at Usain Bolt sprinting with a sled, this would fit in the Bondo trick system as a form of competition exercise. For those who don't know Su Bing Tian, he is the fastest sprinter in the world over 60 metres, and the fastest sprinter ever from Asia. As part of his training, you can see him recreate the arm motion of the sprint or trying to pull against resistance bands. This exercise is presumably to help his arms assist his legs in driving force into the ground to propel him forward while sprinting. He also recreates the motion of his leg in the air driving backwards, presumably to hit the ground with more force propelling him forward. So on to the use of competition exercises and specialised developmental exercises as they relate to martial arts and combat sports. One obvious use of competition exercises is in sparring, as this will provide a way of training quality such as coordination, timing, etc. Looking more at the strength and conditioning side of things, banded punches are an obvious way of developing strength and explosiveness in a competition style movement. You can see 2022 Boxer of the Year Dimitri Bivol training his punch technique here. For wrestling, it's common to see wrestlers from former Soviet bloc countries doing routines with bands. If you look at the movements, you can see they have a correspondence to wrestling movements such as wrapping an overhook, snapping head down, the drop step, pommeling and other movements. 
I would say these fit in the framework somewhere as either competition exercises or specialised developmental exercises, as depending on the angle of the band, it may or may not recreate the resistance that would be applied in a competitive setting. An example of a specialised developmental exercise for boxing or kickboxing would be a landmine punch, as this recreates aspects of the punch action. Specialised developmental exercises for moving into striking range would be forward lunges with banded resistance, also a reverse lunge with banded resistance. I will leave a link in the description for this video to a Dr. Yesis article where he describes why banded forward and reverse lunges are a specialised strength exercise for moving forwards and backwards into striking range. If you see this exercise being done on screen by Tyson Fury, Dr. Yesis describes in the blog this exercise as having a particular correspondence to the actions of moving into range and retreating from being inside range. Whilst I think some of the exercises, such as banded punches and kicks, have an obvious relation to the competition movement, in this case it is less clear. Whilst this movement may involve an element of a vertical jump, equally the front foot drives backwards whilst the back foot drives forwards, so you are training the advance and retreat with each jump. A landmine punch may be an effective exercise for increasing the punching power of a boxer, but a kickboxer may not have as much time to put in a one specific skill, such as a right cross, and then an MMA fighter will have even less time. I think specialised developmental exercises can be an effective training method for martial arts and combat sports, but it comes down to identifying a couple of priority skills. Getting the video back on topic about Bondarchuk, a key feature of Bondarchuk's training which some of the other YouTube videos about him are focused on, is about his emphasis on explosiveness over max strength. To quote Bondarchuk, benching 150 kg at 8 to 10 meters per second is much better than benching 250 kg at 1 to 2 meters per second. Slow maximal training has virtually no transfer to the throw. Unquote. Whilst this emphasis on explosiveness makes sense for a thrower in other sports, you also have to factor in that for a combat sports athlete, endurance is going to be a large factor. So in conclusion, why is Anatoly Bondarchuk a legend of sports science? He is a legend because he is a very successful coach who is also an Olympic gold medalist himself. He has training methods that would be considered unique by your average trainer in the gym, but I would say are disproportionately used by some of the world's best athletes, and also have a fair bit of substantiation both from the success of Bondarchuk's athletes and in the sports science journals.